This is the sixth and final message in our series on Love Conquers All. If you want to catch the uh, first five episodes in this series, you can go back on our YouTube page and watch them. But today, we're finishing up our exploration of 1 Corinthians 13, and it ends with this really interesting triad that talks about faith, hope, and love. And then the author goes on to say that the greatest of these is love. So stick around and listen to this message because it's gonna help us understand uh, how we can live out love in our lives and just really bring this whole series to a practical close. Let's pray. Oh God, open our eyes to empathy, curiosity, humility, and to the way of love that we might be generous and compassionate toward others and ourselves, amen. Our journey through this iconic passage on love from 1 Corinthians 13 draws to a close today with this famous reflection by the Apostle Paul. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I've become a man, I've put an end to childish things. For a long time, I used to think that Paul was shunning his childhood, equating childishness with immaturity. We do the same thing. We use phrases like, quit acting like a child, or you're being a child. We remember our childhood years as a time when we were naive, immature, maybe even foolish. And we don't, we don't dare live that way now, right? Not, not with the complexities and challenges of adulthood. Or maybe. What if there is a different way to hear what Paul was saying? What if, instead of demeaning childishness, Paul was telling us that in the context of the faith, childishness is actually a key to maturity? After all, when you think about your own childhood, isn't there a part of it that you miss? Last December, the Today Show had a segment about the growing nostalgia industry in which adults purchase items or experiences that remind them of their childhood. Roughly a quarter of the people who buy kids toys today are adults who purchase toys for themselves. These so-called kidults, K-I-D-U-L-T-S, are fueling 60% of the growth in the toy industry, spending some $9 billion annually. I will even admit to you that just this past week, I bought a Lego set for myself. Thank you very much. This trend grew dramatically during the pandemic, as you might imagine, when people were cooped up in their homes and, and many adults were wanting to escape the stresses and strains of life by reaching back in their memory toward a simpler time, a more innocent time, a less stressful time. Isn't there a part of all of us who can identify with that? Last week, I spent time with both of my daughters, celebrating with my older daughter, Grace, on her graduation from San Diego State, and moving my younger daughter, Maddie, out of her dorm room in Washington, D.C. Maddie had spent much of the past two weeks studying for finals, packing up her dorm room, and trying to line up an apartment to move into in the D.C. area for her junior year. All of this was stressful, particularly the scarcity of affordable housing and rising rental rates. So after a roller coaster of a time trying to find a place to live, and after finally finding one to move into, she texted me these words, adulting is hard. I remember her saying to me once, Dad, sometimes I think it would be nice to go back to kindergarten with naps and snacks and a grown-up reading you stories. So last week, to celebrate the end of her sophomore year, after we moved her stuff out of her dorm room and into her new apartment, we assembled that Lego set together. It was glorious. It was innocent, stress-free, and nostalgic. And in the words of 1 Corinthians 13, it was a childish thing. So when Paul ends this chapter by saying that as he grew up, he had to put away childish things, I wonder if he was saying this not to demean childhood, but to long for it. Maybe when Paul was thinking about his years as a youth, he was feeling wistful, not regretful. Maybe 
Having weathered years of struggle and trial, he now regarded his youth as a time of optimism and energy, if not a little naivete. In other words, maybe there was a part of him that wanted to recapture his youthful spirit, not suppress it. And what if the same can be said about your faith journey? It's possible that over the years, as your faith has grown more mature and more nuanced, the years of struggle and difficulty have actually made you more cynical, more jaded, less energized, and less enthusiastic about your faith in Jesus. And when you look back on the infancy years of your faith, when believing was easier and the faith felt less complicated, you view that as a time of immaturity. But how about this? Maybe Paul is calling you to reclaim that early season of faith and remember what is still true about it. Jesus said, after all, that we must have faith like a child. And what is it that we learned about the faith when we first started on our faith journey? It was love, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And think of all the people in your life who loved you into being family members and Sunday school teachers, the grandparents and neighbors, the whole village of persons who nurtured that faith when you were just a child. You would discover that since the beginning of your life, love was there. The love of God, the love of others, and the love that was the foundation of your faith. So maybe instead of putting away childish things, you ought to recapture it. So what if you spent some time this week practicing a little bit of faith nostalgia, remembering and giving thanks for the things you believed about God when you were younger. Reclaim that sense of optimism and joy that marked days that seemed less complicated, less stressful, and more innocent. You might dust off that Bible you were given as a child or reread passages that were meaningful to you as a youth. Or listen to songs that you learned in camp. Make a list of as many faith memories of your childhood as you can remember. And I bet what will emerge is this common thread. Love. A love that has been there since the beginning. That wove its way into the fabric of your life and is still there today. And most importantly, it is a fabric that will endure all the way until the end. Love never ends. That's what Paul noticed about his own past as he was writing that letter. Love has been there since the beginning. And then notice the next thing he wrote. After reflecting on his past, he immediately swiveled toward the future. Now we see a reflection in a mirror, he said, and then we will see face to face. Now I know partially but then I will know completely in the same way that I've been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain these three things. And the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. What do you, what do you suppose that means? Why, why is love a more important and more enduring aspect of our future than either faith or hope? Years ago, I came across an answer to that question in the form of a song by Andrew Peterson titled, No More Faith. In the song, Andrew Peterson ponders what it will be like to be in heaven, to be in the presence of God for the rest of eternity. Now, while we don't know exactly what that will be like or what that will look like, Peterson said, there will be no more need for faith, no more need for hope. There will instead be the undeniable presence of God, which negates the need for faith, and the eternal end to all of our sufferings and difficulties, which negates the need for hope. All there will be in heaven, all there will need to be, is love. The love that has marked us since the childish days of our youth will be there forever. Love never ends. So Andrew Peterson's song, No More Faith, goes like this. 
This is not another song about the mountains, except about how hard they are to move. Have you ever stood before them like a mustard seed that's waiting for some proof? I say faith is a burden, it's a weight to bear, it's brave and bittersweet, and hope is hard to hold to, Lord I believe, only help my unbelief, till there's no more faith and no more hope, I'll see your face and Lord I'll know that only love remains, only love. A few weeks ago in my midweek message, I reflected on the life of the Reverend Dr. John Stroman, a senior pastor of Pasadena Community Church in St. Petersburg, which I attended as a youth. He was there during the childish season of my faith, I shared how Jack Stroman helped me navigate a crisis of faith during my first year in college when I began to have serious doubts and questions about my Christian faith. Jack never reprimanded me for having questions. He never disparaged my critical thinking about the Bible or God or Christianity. Instead, he showed me how the history of the church is filled with good, honest questions which prompted an expansion of our theology and our understanding of God. Most of all, Jack continued to rekindle what was central to my faith, love. God's love for me, God's love for all people, God's love revealed in Jesus through the resurrection. Basically, he encouraged me to never put away this childish aspect to my faith. This past Wednesday, as I was writing today's sermon, I learned that Jack Stroman died, and he has now claimed the promise of the resurrection for himself. There is no more need for Jack Stroman to have faith. All the evidence is before him in the presence of God for eternity. And there is no more need for Jack to have hope, for the sufferings and challenges of life are vanquished forever. All that remains, all that needs to remain, for Jack and all the saints in glory, is love. It is the love that God has for us since the childish days of our faith, and the love that will be with us for the rest of eternity. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. God, we thank you for love. Thank you for the love that formed us in your image and marked us in our baptism and, and helped us during the earliest years of our faith. Help us not to let go of these essential childish qualities of faith. Thank you for those who loved us into being that we might do the same for others along the way. Teach us to trust you, to walk with you until the very end where love will endure. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for watching this message today. I hope you found it inspirational and helpful for something that you're going through in your life. If you want to take this message a little bit further, uh, we have some reflection questions down in the notes below, or you can go to hydeparkumc.org slash next steps and find a small group to join or some other people to talk about this with, or just come and visit our church and watch us in person. We'd love to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. See you next time.